Do you have a paranormal encounter you'd like to share with us? Send us an email with your story for a chance of it being featured on Weird World. Will had long been on the lookout for one of the small houses in Barrett Square and after many months finally saw a notice board advertising that one of the charming little abodes was to be let. Within 10 minutes he was in the office of the agent for number 29. The clerk informed him that the present lessee, Sir Arthur Bazenthwaite, was anxious to get rid of the remainder of his lease as soon as possible, for the house had painful associations for him after the death of his wife there not long before. He was a wealthy man, as Lady Bazenthwaite had been a considerable heiress, so was willing to accept a low price, so as to move without delay. Will viewed the house the next morning, and within a week, transference of the lease was arranged. Will had been in the house for only a couple of weeks when Sir Arthur called on him, a charming man in Will's opinion whose motive for calling was to be assured that he found the house comfortable. He asked to be shown around, which Will was happy to do, and only stopped short at the front bedroom of the third floor. The room, he said, had the most painful associations for him, from which Will concluded that it was this room where his wife had died. As it was a lovely October afternoon, the pair wandered into the small walled back garden, where Sir Arthur lingered for some time, perhaps with regretful memories of himself and his companion planning and decorating the little plot. Indeed, he hinted as much when he took his leave, thanking Will a thousand times for letting him see the little garden again. As he turned to go into the house, his eyes looked steadfastly and wistfully down the bright borders. The lighting of houses in London was restricted at the time, so Will was horrified when, returning from dinner a night or two later, he found a bright light streaming cheerfully from the third floor window with no blind to obscure it. Proceeding hurriedly upstairs, he strangely found the room in darkness and with the blinds drawn down to block any illumination being seen from outside. There seemed no explanation for the anomaly he had seen, except that it was perhaps a reflection from another house, but subconsciously he felt that he had made no mistake. Will was still sorting through books and papers which he had not had time to discard before moving, and the next night found an illustrated magazine that he had kept for some forgotten reason. In a curious coincidence, there was a picture of his own back garden and portraits of the Basenthwaites accompanying an article wherein Lady Basenthwaite had been interviewed. He added it to the pile of rubbish and soon realised that it was after midnight and he had not eaten. The dining room opened into the little back garden and there he sat warming himself by the smouldering fire and eating a biscuit when suddenly he thought he heard a step on the tiled walk in the garden outside. He quickly went to the window and drew aside the thick curtain, letting all the light in the room pour outside. There, beyond doubt, was a man bending over one of the beds, who, startled by the illumination, rose, ran to the end of the yard, vaulted over the wall, and disappeared. At the last second, Will glimpsed his silhouetted face, and, to his indescribable astonishment, recognised Sir Arthur Bazenthwaite. The next morning, Will ordered a strong barrier of iron spikes to be erected along the outer wall. Sir Arthur's devoted midnight vigil seemed quite irregular and to be discouraged. Will was expecting his friend Hugh Granger, who was to stay for a night or two, and decided to test the front spare room for comfort prior to his arrival. Accordingly, the following night he went to bed there, finding the room pleasant and restful, all thoughts of its last occupant and the phantom light out of his head. However, with sleep came instantly an appalling nightmare with a sense of impotent flight from some hideous spiritual force, a sense of powerlessness and terror and the strangling desire to scream. Soon came awareness that it was but a dream, that he was lying in bed and his fears were imaginary, but he felt paralysed and unable to open his eyes 
although he sensed that the vivid light he had seen was now in the room. There was a horror of expectancy when he finally sat up and looked. In the armchair, just opposite the foot of his bed, sat Lady Basinthwaite, whose picture he had seen in the illustrated magazine. There was no doubt it was she, dressed in a bedgown, and in her hand a small fluted china bowl, with a cover and saucer. As he looked, she removed the cover and began to feed herself with a spoon, taking some half-dozen mouthfuls, then replacing the cover again. As she did this, she turned full face to Will, looking straight at him, and already the shadow of death was fallen on her. She rose feebly, wearily, and took a step towards the bed, and, as she did, the light in the room suddenly faded into impenetrable darkness. Within a couple of minutes, Will had transferred himself to the room below. The following morning, he poured out the history of events in the house to his friend Hugh, whose ruling passion was intrigue around crime and ghosts. Hugh was happy to sleep in the haunted room, but asked that Will place another bed in there for himself. Two simultaneous witnesses of the same phenomena were ten times more valuable than one, notwithstanding the men's self-confessed terror of what they might see. They discussed the fear of the unknown and even Sir Arthur's strange behaviour, which seemed unconnected, before later settling down to sleep in the third-floor spare bedroom. They lay there for some time before Will noticed that the thick darkness of the room was thinning, objects becoming more visible, until finally the room lit up as if a lamp had been turned on. There again, in the chair at the foot of Hugh's bed, sat Lady Basinthwaite, again putting aside the cover of her dish and sipping its contents. At the end, she again rose feebly, wearily, as if in mortal sickness, looking at Hugh and then turning to look at Will through the shadow of death that lay over her face. Will thought that in her eyes was a demand, a calm, inexorable gaze of justice that must be done. Then the light faded and died out. With fumbling fingers, Hugh found his light switch and was already out of bed with streaming forehead and chattering teeth. He said that now he knew something that he had half guessed before and summoned Will downstairs. Picking up the poker and shovel from the fireplace, he asked Will to show him where he had seen Sir Arthur. After illuminating the garden with light from the house, Will pointed to the spot where Hugh loosened and dug into the earth. Soon they heard the shovel grate on something hard and Will guessed what was happening. Slowly and carefully with his fingers, Hugh drew out fragments of a broken china cover. Then delving again, he raised from the hole a fluted china bowl, the one that Will had seen before twice. After cleaning all the earth from the bowl, the two friends found all over the bottom a layer of a thick porridge-like substance. A portion of this they sent the next day to a chemist, asking for his analysis of it. It was mainly oatmeal, and in it was mixed a considerable quantity of arsenic. Hugh and Will read the chemist report in his little front sitting room, where on the table stood the fragments of the china bowl with its cover and saucer. In the dark afternoon, they stood close to the window to decipher the minute handwriting, when there passed the figure of Sir Arthur Basinthwaite. He waved, and a moment afterwards, the front door bell rang. Let him come in and see that on the table, said Hugh. In the moment's pause as the door was opened, and Sir Arthur was obviously taking off his coat, they heard from outside, some few doors off, a traction engine slowly approaching, crunching new-laid stones on the road. Sir Arthur entered the room, and his glance instantly fell on the bowl. In one second, the very aspect of humanity was stripped from his face, his mouth drooping open, his eyes monstrous and protruding. What had been a pleasant, neat-featured face became a mask of terror, a gargoyle seen in nightmares. Even before the door behind him was closed, he had turned and gone with a crouching, stumbling run, slamming the front door latch. 
Whether what happened then was design or accident, Will never knew, as Sir Arthur fell forward straight in front of the broad crunching wheels of the traction engine.